Well, hello, hello, my lovelies. Welcome back to another episode of Ginger Arky. I am your host, Trisha Stewart Mann. I have hyphenated my last name because I'm a radical feminist. Not really. Um, <laughs> today, I have an awesome guest that I call friend as well. This is Michael Meharry. Some of you probably know him from Liberty Circle. Some of you may not. Um, the We Are Libertarians podcast network, which I'm lucky enough to be a part of, uh, has several people that are new to liberty, maybe some conservatives, maybe some liberals, um, people that aren't really politically that interested and are just kind of Googling libertarianism and come across it. So um, Mike is a anarcho-Christian or a Christian anarchist. Did I say that right? Am I explaining it? Or do you like to call yourself something different? I don't know. You know, there's really not any good words for what I am. Well, let's make <laughs> one up right now. I, I don't know. I, I usually I like the term voluntarist mm -hmm. because I think that's really the most description descriptive of my philosophy. The idea that all associations should be voluntary. We shouldn't use violence, force and coercion in our relationships with other human beings. Um, but, you know, when you say voluntarist, everybody's just like, I don't know what that means. Yeah. Um, or they you think say, you like to go to the food bank a lot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when you say anarchist, people think that you're going to burn garbage cans and throw bricks through windows. So I don't do that. So I don't know. But don't yeah. lie. <laughs> um, when you say, you know, that everything should be done consensually, you know, without violent coercion, kind of sounds a lot like somebody that walked the earth 2000 years ago. So. Yeah, it does. Right. <laughs> um, so just a quick bio on you. You um, do a lot of things besides your podcast, which is called Godarchy. Mm -hmm. um, which I believe is probably only a few years old now, two, three. Yeah, I think I've been doing the podcast for two years. I actually created the website, like I think in 2016. So Godarchy has existed for a while, but it started out more just as me writing. And then I uh, started the podcast a couple of years ago. Um, it, which by the way, it's one of my favorite podcasts. In fact, I think it's on the list at um, libertarianpodcast.com. I know that we host it and kind cool. of put up what's, what's up there. So those are some of the our favorite libertarian podcast and some of the most popular. So if you guys are interested in Christian anarchy, go to Godarchy podcast. Is it Godarchy or Godarchy podcast? It's Godarchy.org is where you can okay. find all things Godarchy. You were lucky to get in early and get that title. Yep. <laughs> um, you also work for the 10th Amendment Center. Uh, you are the communications director there. Mm -hmm. And then are you still an editor at Shift Gold? I am indeed. Okay. And you do a podcast there as well, right? I do. It's called the Friday Gold Wrap. Uh, which is every Friday. It's kind of a 15 to 20 minute, <clears throat> excuse me, sum up of uh, the week in gold and, and economic news. And then I'm actually getting ready to start a new, uh, well, kind of revamp an old show uh, for Shift Gold, which is going to be more interview oriented. So uh, a couple okay. times a month interviewing folks uh, talking about gold, silver, investing, economics, those type of things. My uh, my husband is a big fanboy of Peter <laughs> <laughs> and all things precious metal. So I'll have yeah. to turn him on to that. He actually helped bring him over to libertarianism. Oh, cool. Uh, so yeah. that's pretty cool. Uh, and then you have uh, several ebooks. I know that you, the recent, most recent book you authored was Constitution Owner's Manual because you're a mini status. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm a, I think I'm a, you use tools in your toolbox, right? And so yeah, exactly. One of those tools. Yeah. So you guys can get a copy of that. Probably go to michaelmahiri.com, right? That's correct. And we'll put that in the show notes and we'll ask you again at the end. Cool. But today we're talking about Godarchy and your journey to um, libertarian anarchism. So yeah. were you born an anarchist? Were you born a Christian? I think all people are born anarchists, right? Like little kids are anarchists. Um, but no, I was uh, in, in my you know, high school, really through most of my adult years, I was what you would probably call a neoconservative. Uh, I was very much aligned with the religious right. So, you know, big Rush Limbaugh fan, uh, real active in, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Real active in like pro-life type of things. So, you know, you're pretty standard religious right Republican uh, up until really I was in my, um, I guess, probably my early 40s is when my political viewpoint started to evolve. I was always... I always intuitively believed in limited government. Now, you know, we, we now know that limited government's not really a thing, but as an ideal, that's cool, right? And that's what Republicans were supposed to stand for. So I was, I was all into that. Um, but when Obama was elected, you know, I kind of got caught up in the whole Tea Party movement like a lot of people did and um, started to realize at that point that, you know, 
maybe the Republicans aren't quite as limited government as they make themselves out to be. And when I got involved with the 10th Amendment Center, which was kind of my gateway drug into liberty, which is why I still do constitution stuff today, um, I really started to realize that Republicans and Democrats are pretty much the same side of the uh, two different sides of the exact same coin. And uh, that the Republicans were no more limited government than the Democrats were. And uh, that kind of started my slide into libertarianism and, uh, and eventually full-blown anti-statism. Um, and a lot of that had to do, again, with the Tenth Amendment Center uh, and, and uh, folks that I was exposed to um, through some live events we did in the early days of the Tenth Amendment Center, particularly Tom Woods very influential uh, in, in terms of opening my eyes to things like Austrian economics and, and uh, you know, and, and anarcho-capitalism as the term is often thrown about. So yeah, it was, a, it was kind of a slow grind over five or six years, uh, but here I am today in, in a full-blown, you know, let's uh, just do away with the whole state. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so you're, you know, the old joke, how long does it take for um, anarchists? And the it's supposed, <laughs> years to, be, was supposed to be six months. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the hang up for me was foreign policy. Uh, I, I shifted really fast in terms of, uh, you know, ec economics and, and, uh, and those types of things. Uh, Early in that journey, I read Atlas Shrugged, and Atlas Shrugged is a, is a great kind of gateway book as far as you know, making you realize just how horrible uh, the the state is in terms of economics and and destroying the free market. But you know, I grew up in that uh, in, in a in a very military oriented home. My grandfather was a career military, and it was just really hard for me to let go that we've got to bomb brown people in faraway lands in order to be free. Um, that was a tough one for me. And, uh, you know, again, it was it was a speech that Tom did, uh, Tom Woods, that, that kind of broke that. And it was really a simple thing that he said. And, you know, looking back, it's like, duh. But he made the point that the same horrible people that are running the domestic policy that I already hated are running the foreign policy, too. And it was like, Oh, <laughs> you know, if they're bad at this. Chances are. <laughs> yeah. And, and then around that same time, I, I was really kind of at a point in life where I was trying to reconcile my spiritual life and my spiritual identity with my political identity. I was like a lot of folks. Uh, I, I think this is kind of typical American thinking, compartmentalize everything. So you've got, you know, you've got your work and you've got your philosophy on politics and you've got your religion and all of these things exist in kind of different spheres and don't necessarily overlap. And I realized that, you know, I need to have a coherent outlook, a view on life, a coherent philosophy. And I didn't really have one. And so I was starting to try to reconcile my spiritual faith along with my political ideology. And, you know, it doesn't take a real long time when you really start getting to the bare bones of Christianity and what Jesus taught that maybe uh, making war all over the world is not what Jesus would have us to do. And, uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't be celebrating killing people. And so uh, as, as I began, and, you know, and it is, we kind of laugh, it's funny, but it's amazing how entrenched really bad thinking can get in our heads just because we accept so many things that we're taught, uh, you know, indoctrinated with all of our lives. And, and we have this idea that, uh, you know, America is great and holy and it's the, the country of God. And so whatever we do is noble. Um, and we fail to see the fact that, you know, these drone strikes are killing innocent people. And uh, even if they're not innocent in terms of the eyes of the state, I mean, what have they ever done to us? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was that was a real, you know, a real big shifting point for me. And I now, you know, I've gone from probably one of the biggest warmongers you can imagine, a guy who actually sat in 1991 uh, and, you know, made it an intentional part of my day to watch Gulf War One on television because I thought all the bombers and stuff was so cool to being. Uh, anti-war probably being the, uh, the the central policy thing that I'm concerned about. Yeah, um, I can relate so much with that. I think every, you touched on something funny, you said you're one hang up. And whenever I talk to anarchists or people that even just became like, you know, minarchists, libertarians, they did always have one thing that that they were hung up on. And I think it's because we take politics more as a religion <laughs> yeah, than very, well, very which it so. is, I mean, yeah. um, 
statism anyways that is so it's hard to let go because you have you feel connected to it it's kind of part of who you are yeah it's dogma yeah um which is funny because you know if you have faith that should probably be the whole of who you are and everything else should stem from that exactly um, but like you said we compartmentalize um now when you you know you started godarchy you transitions kind of over to voluntarius did you get pushback from like fellow Christians or anybody that maybe had, you know, you had worked with before in the field of liberty or anything like that? Or are they saying, you know, who, who knows what kind of emails you get? <laughs> yeah, I, not really. I mean, you know, there, there is a certain segment in, in our circles that are um, the hardcore atheists. So I, you know, I got a little bit in the early days of the, uh, of the sky daddy, you know, and the, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And, I, honestly, I don't engage that because in, in terms of people's faith and their their view on religion and who God is, I, I learned a long time ago, I'm not going to argue anybody into faith. I'm not going to argue anybody into believing in God. That's not my job. And so if there if a person is is really dead set in uh, you know a philosophy of atheism or, or whatever, that's that's where they are. And I'm not going to try to argue them out of now, if they want to come and ask legitimate questions, if they're seeking, I'm more than happy to talk to folks, but you know, I, I view, I view Christianity as a relationship with God. And I can sit here and tell you how wonderful my wife is and how great she is and what a, what an incredible person is. You're not going to really understand that until you meet her, until you want to meet her. Um, you know, you, you might think, Oh, well, I've heard about her. She's awful. Well, I'm not going to talk you out of it. You have to meet her and get to know her. I think the same thing is true with, with God. So I'm not into arguing religion. So I really will, will try to diffuse that really fast. And like, Hey, you know, first, first off, don't be um, condescending. I have a very, you know, intellectual place that I can come from and we can talk about that if you want to. But on the other hand, I'm not going to look down upon you or, or think less of you because you have a different belief system than I do. Um, I, I just don't have time for that in my life. There's plenty of people who really want answers to questions and I'm not going to argue with somebody who doesn't. Yes. Um, and generally I sometimes <clears throat> have gotten kicked back for, you know, my faith beliefs or pretty much anything, you know, right. because I decided that I'm an anarchist. So, you know, there's like four of us in the world, right. but I found <laughs> that it is actually a small percentage of people that just argue with a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's probably not worth my time. Yeah. Um, so what is your goal then with God Archie podcast? Well, that's a really good question. I don't know that there is a goal. Um, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you can say I, that and be honest. Yeah, I mean, I, I so I can tell you why I started God Archie. The kind of impetus was uh, I really wanted to just inject a Christian voice into the world that was anti-war. Um, that was really the, 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 if you look at a lot of the early articles, you know, just um, uh, there's, there's a lot of anti-war stuff. And that was really, you know, I, I've, I've, I came out of this evangelical world, um, where so many people are cheerleaders for the military and for the warfare and for all of those things. Um, and so I wanted there to be some kind of Christian voice that counters that, that, that says, look, maybe we need to step back and look at some of the things Jesus taught, uh, like loving our enemies and, and, uh, uh, not repaying evil with evil and those types of things. Um, and, and since then, I guess it's kind of evolved. It's really just, a, you know, kind of a place for me to work out my faith and my political philosophy and talk about it with folks and, and try to engage other people and, and really just to make people think. Um, I've had a, a lot of different guests. I've had atheists. I've had a Muslim. Uh, I really want to just get discussions out there, bring people together, uh, get people to really think about things. And I guess is a broader view in terms of how God Archie faces the, the world at large. I, I kind of want to hold up a mirror to society and to your average person out there and, and make them own their own violence. Um, you know, we, we know that all government is predicated on violence, force, and coercion. Uh, every single law that exists is ultimately backed up by some guy with a gun. Uh, and you can take that all the way to something as simple as a seatbelt law. If you resist that law long enough, you will get shot. Um, you know, there was a there was a police shooting not too long ago. The whole thing started because somebody had a, a something improper hanging on their rearview mirror. Um, 
So we know that politics is violence, force, and coercion. And there's so many people out there on both sides of the political spectrum or on all sides. Um, they think that they're holy and noble because of their political views. You know, people on the left, we care about people and we're going to give you health care. And, uh, you know, people on the right, we care about unborn babies. Well, if you're using politics to bring your worldview into existence, then you're using violence. And, and you cannot stand on a moral high ground when you are predicating your worldview on violence, force, and coercion. So that's that's I guess I guess to answer your question, that's kind of what God Arche is is doing. It's holding up a mirror to the world and saying, own your violence, force, and coercion. And maybe that's not the best way to organize a society. Yeah, Especially if you're I, a Christian. I love, I love how you say that because honestly, it really just boils down to that. Uh, you could make every excuse under the world. Well, what if they come in and get us? And obviously self-defense is not, you know, violent. Right. But, um, you know, what if, but if this, and if this person does this, and do you want a world like this? And they're all what ifs, but it doesn't matter because even if the worst thing happens, your answer shouldn't be violence. <laughs> right. Right. I'm going to hit you. Yeah. And, and, and I think you hit on a key thing. You know, there, there, is, there is defensive violence. And I think as, as far as the libertarian philosophy goes, uh, defensive violence is certainly uh, ethically allowable. Right. You can repel force. You can resist people who are aggressing against you. Now, as a Christian, uh, I have some struggles with even how far defensive force can go. But in terms of politics, we we know that uh, that that defensive violence is permissible from an ethical standpoint. So that's really how you should look at things that the government does. Um, because, you know, even in a stateless society, we're going to still have some form of governance. Um, so what type of violence is allowed? Well, the type of violence that is defensive. So when you look at like the, the criminal system, I don't have a problem with punishing somebody who has stolen your property or who has aggressed against somebody physically, you know, the murder, rape, those types of things. Defense violence is appropriate in that case because it is defensive. You are defending yourself from somebody else's aggression. Uh, but when you get to things like seatbelt laws, drug laws, prostitution laws, I mean, the vast majority of the laws are out there up to and including the way government funds itself. Uh, you don't have any justif justification for shooting somebody for that. You know, I, I can't justify going into your house and saying, Tricia, you know, my mom has cancer, so I need some money for her health care. So I'm going to rob you. And if you don't give me some money, I'm going to shoot you. Nobody can do that. Well, this is what the government does every day. And we justify it by saying, well, you know, we're doing good things like building roads. <laughs> that, which brings me to another question. You have so much good meat in there. I, I appreciate what you said. But there's something that I call the, the uh, libertarian Christians um, roads. <laughs> and that's, you know, when when people talk about a certain verse that I'm sure you're I know of. exactly where we're going. <laughs> it's Romans 13. Yes. <laughs> That's my roads when Christian libertarians. Yeah, exactly. It's supposed to be this conversation stopper. Yes. You like, know, as exactly. soon as you start, as <laughs> soon as you start talking anti state, oh, Romans 13. Like, I've never heard that before. Yeah. You know, it's like, the wait, same what, thing when you. What book is that in? Is that the New Testament or the Old Testament? It's the, it's the same thing if you're talking about the Constitution and somebody wants to throw Spooner at me, you know, yeah. as if as if I've been doing this for like over 10 years and I've never read anything that Spooner had to say. This is not a shock to me. You know, it's not, it's not like I haven't wrestled <laughs> Which with I do this love before. Spooner, but I bet you if the Absolutely. worked for him, he would use this. <laughs> well, and, and in fact, in his early days, Spooner did actually yeah. use the Constitution. But that's I mean, that's that's getting kind of off the track. But. It, the same thing is true of Romans 13. This is not a shocking thing to me. I've heard this verse. You know, you're not you're not stumping me with Romans 13. Okay, so I'm going to play the I want to say devil's advocate, but that feels weird in this yeah. conversation. Yes, um, but I guess maybe not. Anyways, that's a long. So what if I was to say to you, well, if he says, you know, follow, you know, follow the government, then why would we not do it? What what would right. be your answer to somebody? Well, I mean, I start off by I think. First off, I think that the whole context of Romans 13, the content of Romans 13, is much more complicated than I think a lot of people, including some Christian anarchists, want to make it. You know, I'm not comfortable just writing off those verses like they don't exist, and some people will, will do that. Um, so I like to start by casting doubt on the 
kind of traditional statist viewpoint of it that somehow it means that we're supposed to do whatever the government tells us. That is clearly not the case if you read any other passage in the Bible. Um, I can point out countless um, Bible stories, Bible events, historical events where uh, people who were considered to be of God uh, resisted the government. We can start with Moses, uh, you know, his uh, his mother putting him in a basket. Uh, we can go to Peter talking about, you know, we are to follow God and not man. Uh, so there's there's all kinds of examples of this. It clearly does not mean that we do whatever the government tells us. Um, and, and then I can take it to the modern example. You know, does does that mean that the uh, that the German guard who uh, marched the Jews into the showers, that they were somehow morally justified because of Romans 13. That's absurd. It doesn't make any sense. So there must it must mean something else besides what the statists are trying to tell us that it means. And then we can get into it and, and really dig into it and say, okay, well, what, what is this telling us? And, and that gets a little bit more complicated, I think. Um, for me, I kind of look at it as, uh, as Roman, I think Rosa Parks is a perfect example of Romans 13 in action. Uh, the law told her that she was supposed to do something that was unjust. She was supposed to go to the back of the bus and she simply refused to go to the back of the bus. Now she didn't tear the bus up. She didn't punch the cop in the mouth. Uh, she didn't resist. She accepted the consequences of her refusal to go along with this injustice. Um, but she didn't just bow to something that was unjust and wrong. And I think that's kind of what Romans 13 gets to. Um, we are obviously to follow the laws of God. And sometimes there's going to be consequences to that when they uh, come into conflict with the laws of the world. And at that point, we don't resist. We don't fight back. We don't pick up a gun and start a rebellion. Uh, we approach it in the same way that the early church did with the Romans. And they didn't do all the Roman stuff. They didn't go worship in the pagan uh, uh, temples, and, and they were supposed to. I mean, this wasn't just a matter of religion for the Romans. It was part of their civic duty to, uh, to do Roman religion, and they refused to do it. And that's why we have all of these Christian martyrs in the early days of, of uh, the church, because uh, they refused to follow the edicts of the government, and yet they were also very emphatic in the fact that we are not going to create a rebellion. We're not going to try to overthrow the emperor. We're not going to, uh, you know, start a Christian war. Uh, we're we're going to submit. Um, insofar as we will accept the consequences for not doing what you tell us. So that's kind of where I think Romans 13 is getting to, but uh, you know, we can go even farther into that. And I don't want to, cause then we're getting into some, some pretty, I like it. Sorry. Yeah. It's, it's a great because <laughs> I'm sure I, I think you did do a show on it a couple. Yeah, before. actually I have, yeah. um, um, but I think I, I, interesting for, for people who really want to kind of think, think through this more deeply, read Romans 13 and then go read revelation 13, because those two, chapters have very divergent views of what government is and what government does. And um, one of my favorite theologians, William Stringfellow, actually has a whole book where he juxtaposes those two things and, and, and kind of looks at the tension between those two chapters in the Bible. And uh, that really kind of helps you understand as well that, again, Romans 13 is not this simplistic statist platitude that, oh, well, you're supposed to do what the government says. Yes. Or we, we could also look, you know, at everything uh, that said, like, we'd all be plucking our eyes out and cutting off our hands. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> if we took it literally, which, you know, wouldn't always be the worst thing. But I'd have, um, <laughs> I'd have no hands or eyes. So, so like keeping on that a little bit, um, as far as your fellow Christians go, what do they think of you being an anarchist? I think most of them think I'm nuts. <laughs> like, well, you, you know, kind of are. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> you know, that's the thing that that's the struggle for us, right? We have embraced a philosophy that is very beautiful and coherent when you understand it, but it's not simple. You know, you really have to start with some things to understand where we're coming from. You have to start with the idea of self-ownership and you have to start the start with the ideas of non-aggression. And you can't you can't put our political and, and spiritual philosophy in a tweet. And we live in a world where people want they want it in a tweet. 
you know, however many characters a tweet is, I don't even know, but, um, yeah, that's not, very difficult to do. Yeah. I'm not either. I'm horrible at Twitter. Obviously I have used a lot of words. Um, but so that's, that's the struggle. And so, you know, when, when you are initially in engaging with somebody and, and you say, oh yeah, I'm a voluntarist or I'm an anarchist, they have all of these preconceived notions. They're not going to self-ownership and non-aggression. They're going to, you know, dudes setting, like I said, setting garbage cans on fire or breaking windows, or they immediately go to all those questions. Well, what about the roads, you know, or Romans 13? It, it's very difficult. You have to develop relationships with people um, for them to begin to understand where you're coming from, I think. So I think from the outside, uh, I think a lot of people like, I, my impression of what like people in my church think of me that Mike Meharry, he's a pretty cool guy. He's a good Christian. He's got some weird politics though. I, I don't know, you know? Yeah. Um, but then as you, as you engage with people, then they start to understand it. Like my, my pastor, you know, I've, I've now known him for about a year and a half. Uh, we came to this church when we moved down here about a year and a half ago. And, and I think he's starting to get it. Like he hasn't embraced it, but at least he gets where I'm coming from. Yeah. And he knows that it's not some kind of crazy thing because we've been able to talk about some of these first principles like self-ownership and, uh, you know, the idea that, that God is not forcing his will upon us. So therefore we don't have the right or authority to force our will upon other people. Um, but, you know, this, this is a thing that frustrates. I feel like sometimes I was, I was born in the wrong century. Um, because I love reading like uh, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and these letters that they wrote back and forth to each other. Those folks in those times, they were very deep thinkers. They spent a lot of time reading and writing. Uh, we spend a lot of time watching television and doing sports ball. You know, I wore my sports ball shirt for you today, <laughs> by the way. You know um, how much I love my sports ball. Oh, I know. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it's, 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 we live in a hard world and uh, I think our philosophy tends to attract a lot of people who like to read and, and like to do philosophy and like to reason, but a lot of people don't like that. And that's a challenge. That's something that, that I often think about and wish I was better at, at, at packaging these ideas into uh, things that your average person can grasp, you know, music and art and those types of things, because that's where our culture is communicated. Um, people aren't going to sit down and read some of these books behind me, you know, the human action is not something your average person is going to pick up and read. So it's a challenge. And, and that's, that's what I think shows like what you're doing are important because us having these conversations and other people listening in, will give them some ideas, uh, and, and maybe spark some thinking and some curiosity outside of, you know, what they're typically getting in their Facebook free feed or Twitter or, you know, perusing YouTube videos. I think that is the beauty of podcasts um, mm -hmm. because it's kind of, well, it's just ba basically a short speech or, um, you know, interview with people that I do think that that uh, podcast coming along and kind of replacing maybe talk radio and things like that. It's actually yeah. pretty good because you have so much to pick from and it really yeah. makes you think and, and you can do it while you're doing other things. So it's great for, you know, your lay person or somebody that's right. not into sitting down and cracking open, you know, Rothbard or anything like that. Right. Um, the other thing that's really <laughs> cool about podcasting is, is, um, you know, a lot of times you get in a conversation, like we're having a conversation now. Uh, and, and that's really my interview style is to just have a conversation. Sometimes you get really deep, you know, it's almost like you forget that you're doing a podcast and it's like, I'm just having a conversation with this person. And uh, actually my last episode, uh, I did uh, an interview with a guy named Mark West. Who I a, listened to it. It yeah. was, I, I generally try to get, I subscribe. So I try to get all of them, but that was excellent. Yeah, he so, just really- Really he's a, is great. He's a cool dude. And, and he's, he's really exploring and, and questioning and, and wrestling with a lot of things. And I think at the end of that podcast, we both kind of were just having this conversation. We both got pretty, pretty personal about some of some of the things that we're struggling with. Um, you don't necessarily get that in a TV interview, you know, because people are kind of on guard and, and whatnot. So that's one of the things I, I do love about podcasting is that you can kind of get an intimacy and in a uh, and, and formality that you don't get, get in other forms of media. And uh, speaking of podcasts, <laughs> you reminded me that we're on one. <laughs> um, so we're going to take a quick break from our sponsors. But when we come back, I kind of want to get down to something you were talking about in your last episode um, about American evangelical Christianity. So cool. we'll be right back. Stay tuned. Hello, hello, my lovelies. We are back. 
and I am talking to Michael Mahari. Mike Mahari, you you prefer Mike, right? <laughs> I I go by Mike okay. casually. I write when like when I write, I usually go by Michael. It's so you can okay. take a pick. Okay, we're gonna be fancy. This is Michael <laughs> Mahari. <laughs> yes, I, I, yes, that's talking... my scholarly name, Michael yes. <laughs> Mahari. Um, PhD? No. No. <laughs> two ba two bachelors. That's the best I can uh, give you. Oh well, that almost stacks up to one. Right. Um, so we were talking a little bit about um, his uh, podcast, Godarchy, and being an uh, anarchist and a Christian. And we touched a little on Romans 13. And it reminded me, you were talked about this in your last episode, but it's always a hot topic for people that are Christians and anarchists, um, is this wave of American evangelical Christianity. So I really mm -hmm. think that Christianity is very suitable with anarchism, obviously, and libertarian philosophy. And they really weren't that far apart for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then from what I've read historically, I think it's somewhere around the 1920s, the, the church started to evolve in America. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, not so much the history, but I, I can definitely um, I can definitely speak to how American evangelicalism started to um, you know, what I would consider Orthodox Christianity. Um, it, it, it became very political, um, both on the left and the right. Uh, and, and maybe the left isn't quite, you know, what you would call evangelical, but um, they're evangelical in their own way, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it really started to stray away from the, the teachings of Christ and, and whatnot. And it started to evolve into this. We've got to form society into uh, our vision. It's almost like we see this kingdom of God and it's like, we're going to make that happen. But that's hard, so let's get the government to do it for us. And again, we're getting to this, this idea of, um, of using violence, force, and coercion, which is the exact opposite of what Jesus did when he established the kingdom. And, and I think it's important if you to really look at you know, Jesus as the Messiah and the expectations that folks had um, when he was walking the earth of what the Messiah was supposed to be. They believed that they were going to have another King David, that this mighty ruler was going to, was going to come up and uh, he was going to raise up an army and he was going to overthrow the, the burdensome yoke of the Romans. Um, it was very much a nationalistic, militaristic type of, um, of viewpoint. Now, of course, there were religious aspects to it. You know, don't get me wrong. It wasn't all about that, but that's what they viewed. They, David was going to come back. And we saw very early on that this wasn't the kind of Messiah that Jesus was going to be. You know, he was talking about turning the other cheek and loving your enemies. And um, he was tweaking the religious institutions of the day. And it really comes to a head when he enters into Jerusalem towards the end of his life on a donkey. That symbolism is extremely important. Uh, the expectation would be that the Messiah would ride in on a, on a white stallion, literally. I mean, that's what generals did. And the whole triumphant entry is, is kind of a, um, it, it alludes to these great military victories, uh, parades that they had when, when these rulers came back as conquering heroes. And Jesus came back, uh, no, I'm coming in on a donkey. And instead of uh, starting a war and, you know, pulling his sword out with Peter. He told Peter to put the sword away. That's not the kind of kingdom we're going to have. He went to the cross and died. He submitted to all of these authorities and he triumphed over them through dying. That's not what anybody expected, but that's hard. And it's not, it doesn't fit into the pattern of this world. And I think we've gotten as, as, as a church in the United States and, and probably a lot of places, but I can speak obviously to hear, uh, we, we've gotten to this point that we've embraced that kind of Israeli messianic view uh, that we're going to somehow triumph over the evils of the world through our grand political uh, efforts. And America is God's country and the constitution was ordained and handed down by God. And, uh, you know, we're going to do it and we're going we're gonna to get rid of immorality, you know, all this horrible abortion and divorce and gay people. And yet we're going to continue to gossip behind each other's back because that's not such a big deal, you know. Um, or, or Americans 
eating lots of food and getting really large. That's not one yeah, of those horrible yeah, things. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> don't, let's not talk about that. So yeah, I really feel like that that the church by and large has strayed away from what the truth of the gospel is. And the gospel is about grace and mercy and peace. Uh, we call the man that we follow the Prince of Peace. And so that's why I am so adamantly anti-war now. How can you follow the Prince of Peace and revel in war. You just yeah. can't do it. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but I think that um, I think that this plays into uh, something that is very prominent in human psychology. And of course, uh, the devil, if, if you want to use the devil as a real person or whether that's just a personification of evil, however you want to perceive that, cool. But um, the forces of evil use that against us. And Human beings want a checklist. You know, we we are control freaks. We want to control everything. We want to control each other. We want to control our own lives. And ultimately, we would like to control God. And I think that's what religion has become. It's a way for us to control God. So we have this checklist of things. I didn't get divorced. I didn't have an abortion. I'm not gay. Therefore, God has to let me into his, uh, into his kingdom. Well, it doesn't work like that. And it really starts to fall apart when all of a sudden you can't check something off that checklist. And that was a huge struggle for me when I got divorced. Um, you know, it was like, uh Oh, <laughs> because I was really, I had really embraced that kind of worldview. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not a checklist and we can't control God. God has no obligation to do anything for us, even if we check off all the little boxes. So maybe we should quit trying to check off the boxes and instead do the things that Jesus taught us to do, to love each other, to serve one another, to bring beauty and joy into the world, um, as, as opposed to trying to force other people to bend to our will or our perception of how society should be. And that's really, to me, how the, the political philosophy philosophy flows into Christianity. Um, the, the political philosophy is teaching um, that we allow, we, we, we interact voluntarily. We don't force other people to do our will. Uh, that's exactly the way Jesus tells us to interact with the world. And that's exactly the way God interacts with us. He didn't, he didn't, uh, doesn't force us to follow him. Uh, he gives us the freedom to choose yes or no. Now, you know, as with all choices, there's there's consequences to those things, but he's not putting a gun to our head and, and saying that you must do this or that. And so therefore, I think we should extend that same grace to our fellow uh, men and women. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that uh, when you started to realize that it wasn't about, you know, checking boxes and being okay, that you did a short stint as an atheist. <laughs> I did. I was the world's what worst that atheist. Like? <laughs> I've, I've, you know, I've, I've gone like agnostic and kind of go, but I don't, I've never in my life, you know, thought there just isn't a God. So that's a weird thought to me. I, I can understand why people believe that. Yeah. Um, what, what was it like? Well, it was, so the reason, and this all came about because of the aforementioned divorce. I mean, I went through a period in my life in, in my early thirties where, where a lot of things in my life flew apart. And uh, I was involved in a church that had split, um, and then my marriage fell apart. And so I think in, in a large part, it was easier to just say that there is no God than to deal with the wreckage in my life. You know, I could just blow it all off by saying there is no God. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I tried to do that really probably pretty hardcore for about three years. Um, and, and I was really bad at it because there was just, there's too much in me that knew that you know, maybe, maybe it's not the God that I understood, but there, there must be a God somewhere. So I had a really good friend who was also an atheist that I worked with. And so we would start talking about spiritual things and religion. And, you know, the next thing, you know, me, the new atheist is arguing the, uh, the Christian perspective with my friend. Uh, Worst so yeah, atheist ever. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, and, and then I went through a period where I was kind of agnostic and, and I don't know. And then, uh, you know, God being God, he kind of just brought me slowly back. And uh, uh, my faith is very different than it was, you know, back in my, my diehard evangelical Christian days. But, but I think it's a much healthier faith. Um, I think the biggest lesson that I had to learn was to be able to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's a hard thing. I, I'm a black and white thinker. I, I, like, I like things to be cha-cha-cha. I like to argue. 
Uh, but there's a lot of things I don't understand, and yeah. um, particularly when it comes to God. And, and even Paul, you know, he wrote in, uh, I think it was in one of the Corinthians, we, we see into a mirror dimly. We, we don't see all of it. Even Paul didn't see all of it, and he wrote half the New Testament. Uh, so therefore, I think it's probably okay for me to say, you know, I don't know. I don't understand all of these things. I don't understand all of the nuances of Romans 13. I can admit that. Yeah. Um, and, and that kind of circles back to that American evangelical Christianity where we try to want it to make everything black and white. Right. And if somehow there's no glory uh, in, you know, saying, I don't know something. Well, being humble, there's no glory in that. We want to be glorified right now as human right. beings all over the globe. You know, we, we want to conflict and conquer and be on top and be the best. And it's, you know, Thing. That's I'm why I'm doing. Sure. <laughs> that's why I'm doing this interview because I'm going to be famous, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, all three people listen. No. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, so, faith and libertarian and anarchist philosophy. It's funny because some people use libertarianism as their faith, and I yeah. think that's a dangerous road to go down. Um, and this is, doesn't have to do with people that are atheist or, or Christian or whatever. Right. Right. Um, it's the fact that they want it to answer all questions, yes. to check every box. What is libertarianism lacking? What is the, <sighs> the philosophy of anarchism and libertarianism lacking? I am so glad you asked this question because this is 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 stopped. Okay, it we had a little skip. You want to go back in? Yeah, we can go back in. I'm not I'm gonna have to edit the middle. That's fine. I'm so glad that you asked that question because this is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Not not even just about libertarianism, but about all kinds of things. I think I think we this is another human tendency. We want this this list, this dogma, uh, to basically be our instruction sheet for everything in life, and. It really doesn't work like that, and, and certainly libertarianism, it's a political philosophy. It tells us a lot of really good things about how we should interact with each other in a political sense. Um, it teaches us a lot of good things about self-ownership and about uh, you know, permissible and unpermissible use of violence and aggression and, and, and whatnot. But just because uh, something is permissible doesn't necessarily mean it's beneficial or it's the right thing to do. I'll give you a perfect example in terms of libertarian philosophy. Uh, as, as a libertarian, I believe that if you own a business, it is perfectly acceptable because it is your property to exclude whomever you choose. So you could, let's say <clears throat> that you're just the, you know, you're just the kind of person that doesn't like interracial marriages and you own a business and you see Mike and Cynthia coming up and you think, I don't want them in my store. That is within your right. That would be ethically permissible within a libertarian framework to exclude me from your private property because of, of whatever reason that is. It doesn't follow that that is a moral and ethical position to take. Just because it's okay within the scope of libertarianism doesn't mean it's necessarily okay in a broader moral ethical sense. I don't think you should exclude people because that's just mean. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and, and so libertarian doesn't really speak to that. It allows for a lot of activities in terms of private property uh, that aren't necessarily beneficial and, and that maybe we should consider uh, whether or not we want, want to follow those things. You know, even looking at something like prostitution, I don't think prostitution is a good thing. I don't want my daughter to be a prostitute. Right. Um, you know, this 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 idea that you see in some circles of libertarianism where we're like supposed to glorify sex work or something like that. Right. I, I'm not comfortable with that because I think there's a lot of problems that go along with uh, unhealthy sexuality like that. That being said, I don't think you should lock somebody in a cage. Yeah. Um, and and so. Libertarianism does inform us of, of, of how we should deal with this as a society. It doesn't necessarily tell us how we should deal with it on an individual basis. Um, so you need more. You need libertarian and something. So for me, right. libertarian and Christianity, we need something else. Now, I see the same problem sometimes in Christianity where, where people want to make the Bible be the answer to every question. And they're looking at Genesis to try to explain uh, you know, how – 
uh, creation happened. I don't think Genesis was meant to be a science book. No. <laughs> um, and and so, you know, we, we need to be broad thinkers. God gave us brains to think, you know, and uh, there's a lot of things that we can look into to understand the way the world works and the way that we should interact with the world and those people around us. And uh, my faith is certainly the the biggest thing that informs that, but my political philosophy informs that. Uh, my own taste and preferences uh, inform that. My culture and background and family, all of those things play into it. And uh, I think we're in a dangerous place when we try to make any one thing, especially a political philosophy, be the entire thing that we center our lives on. And um, I get frustrated with with the you know libertarian. We were joking about the sports balls earlier, um, but you know there's some people that like if you post something about oh that was a great game, you'll get some some neckbeard will show up. Oh, you're doing the sports ball? Why aren't you doing something important? <laughs> I mean, my life doesn't all center on politics. Yeah. You know, I, I Some like people to go do. Play <laughs> I know. And you know what? That's fine. If that's your hobby, more power to you. But, but who are you to criticize me for yeah. you know, wanting to watch sports? Like, I, I don't get video games. I, you know, that just, I was just a little too old for the whole video. I had the Atari, you know, I did the, <laughs> the, the Space Invaders and, and then the Pong thing where I'm bloop, bloop. But I just never got into video. I can't imagine why anybody would want to spend time playing video games. I'm not going to go on Facebook and, and somebody's talking about their video. Oh, what are you doing playing video games? Yeah. No, <laughs> like, so like, I've like, gotten that with certain things. And, and you know, some people, we call them neckbeards. If you guys aren't familiar with it, right. uh, go on social media and on a libertarian page and you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you'll, you will find them or they will find you. Uh, yeah, though, and if you're female, they'll friend you really fast. Yeah, they will. Ooh. Um, but is so many people have like this is the specific answer to this or that, and um, you can't like this, and it's like you do know that two things can be true at the same time, and I can do more than one thing in my life. Yeah, you know, it's like why well, can why are you worried about you know this celebrity or whatever when war is going on? Yeah, I I think it's good to have perspective. I definitely do. But you know, sure. what? sometimes I just like stuff that's funny and entertaining. Yeah. Because yeah. why would I want to be alive if I was just depressed the whole time? Exactly. And I knew I couldn't end it, you know? You know, we, we pursue liberty because we want to live free. Because we believe that will make a better life for us. That's what it's really about. It's about yeah. making, it's about, it's about prospering and, and having- And for generations uh, to come, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So so what's the point of of having liberty and freedom if you don't do anything to enjoy your life. And that brings me, you, you, you brought up another point that's been stuck in my crawl since we're having Mike on his soapbox airing his grievances day. Um, you know, this, this idea that when it comes to how we approach our libertarian work, uh, that there's one way to do it. I am so sick and tired of watching libertarians bitch at each other because they don't think that they're doing it right. You know, you're not doing libertarianism right. So you've got people like who want to throw rocks at the LP because they don't like what the LP is doing. Or, the, you know, people will throw rocks at the Tenth Amendment Center because, oh, you're doing that constitution, you stupid statist. How can you get liberty like that? Or, um, you know, uh, somebody going after the agorists because, well, you need to get involved in politics or yeah. politics will get involved with you. Why do we have to pick one thing and not be the only thing? Like, why can't the LP do its thing and the Tenth Amendment Center do its thing and the agorists do their thing and, and podcasters do their things? There's a lot of uh, liberty to be won. I think maybe we could not waste so much time fighting with each other. You know, it's like, it's like we've got 30 people and we're going to divide up into 28 groups and fight yeah. each other. It's dumb. Yeah. And it's it's like we're, we're this little army in a circle. And the world is coming to attack us. So we right. turn inward and kill like the 20 right. soldiers in there. And then, then, and then along those lines, you know, somebody will hear something that, that I say uh, that they disagree with, which is cool. I would be disturbed if you agree with everything that Mike Meharry thinks and says. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, but just because I say one thing that you might disagree with, even if you disagree with it vehemently, don't throw out everything that Mike Meharry is because you disagree with that one thing. And I see this happening in, in libertarian movements as well. Uh, you know, you'll mention uh, so-and-so, you know, I, I don't want to 
I don't want to pick a name, but just, you know, Joe Blow Libertarian. Uh, I really like Joe Blow Libertarian. Well, did you hear what Joe Lo Blow Libertarian said about IP? I don't, I hate him. <laughs> he said everything else you might agree with, but this one thing I can't, it's like the libertarian purity test. And, and uh, this, this or stuff drives me crazy. A hero and they'll form their philosophy off of every little version of libertarianism, anarchist, and that person. And then yeah. if anybody disagrees with that, well, that's what the hero says. And it's like, right. well, I have a lot of people I really look up to that I would maybe consider heroes because they're really compassionate, kind, whatever. Sure. I don't, there's plenty of times where I'm like, yeah, that was wrong, but yeah. that's okay. I still really appreciate that person, you know? Right. You know, I mean, like, like, I'll give you an example. I love Walter Block. Walter Block is a great economist. I disagree with this position on abortion. That doesn't mean that I hate, I'm, I'm not going to, well, I can't listen to anything Walter Block says because he's got this one uh, position that I don't like. Why do people think like that? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I've, I've posted quotes before by, by um, saying like Martin Luther King. Well, you know, he was a socialist, don't you? No, okay. really? <laughs> okay, does that, does that negate the truth in quote? Well, no, but still he was a socialist. Okay, whatever. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, like, no, I get that with um some some anarcho communists that um I think have some really good points to make sure. and are brilliant people, yeah. and it's like, but but it they too bad they were filthy communists. Like too bad you completely missed the point. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> there there is there is truth to be found in so many places, and yeah. uh, um you know none of us have a monopoly on on the truth. We none of us have a monopoly on the best strategy to use. I certainly have opinions, especially when it comes to, to political strategy. But um, if somebody chooses to do something different, I'm not going to waste my time hating them, especially if our goal is the same, uh, you know, doing away with the state. Um, there, there's there's so much work to be done, and there's there's a place for the agorists and the anarchists and the minarchists and the constitutionalists and the Lockeans and uh, and, and even the even the anarcho communists. I mean, if we can agree with them and work with them in certain in certain areas, why not? Yeah. You know, where our goals where our goals coincide, let's work together. You know, I love working with people on the far left when it comes to surveillance because they're really good on that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I can't get right wingers to work on it because they're out there. Oh, well, you know, if you're not doing anything wrong, you got nothing to hide. Yeah. All right. Whatever. Like, yeah, you know, that always I, I, leads down a good path. Well, that's right. always worked out in history, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, anyway, so that's my that, that's my soapbox. I appreciate you letting me get all that off my chest now. Now people no. will be like, "Hey, Mike Harry, he's a he believes everybody." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I do think, and I I completely agree with that. In fact, um, I'm in a you know chat with some fellow co-hosts, and I think that's part of what I like about our network is we have people from conservatarians to left libertarians to anarchists mm -hmm. or whatever. And we can all get, you know, disagree on things, but it's like, at the end of the day, you should be an adult and say, okay, I'm going to agree to disagree, but thanks for letting me listen to it. You never know when you talk to somebody down the road, if you were kind before that idea is going to stick in their head too, Yeah, you know? So. And I think it's a healthy thing to learn to have relationships and be friends with people that have vastly different worldviews. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I hate to go back to sports balls again, but I'm going to. Because no, you don't. You don't I hate like, that at no, all. No, I hate, don't hate it at all. I love it. <laughs> I, I, work, I work sports into anything that I can. Um, but, you know, it, a, a, a locker room is a fascinating place. And I actually wrote a little article back in, this has been more than a decade ago. I played hockey at the University of South Florida on the, uh, the club hockey team. And, you know, at the time I was 40. So most of the other guys on the team were in their, teens and 20s. So there's a vast age difference, but you had all of these different people, people from different countries, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different races, but we were all on this team together. We all got to know each other. We all became friends because we had this, this common goal together to win hockey games. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a healthy thing to be able to say, you know, I don't agree with your politics, but we can still be friends. We can still hang out. We can still have fun. We can still do things together. We can still, uh, you know, win a hockey game or make the world a better place, even if we disagree on these other things. And I think we need more of that in the world and less um, trying to to fit ourselves into these little silos where nobody's different from each other. You know what I'm saying? 
Yeah. Now I'm starting to sound like a commie leftist. Yeah, look at you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to have to be uh, change the show name to Comarchy. No. <laughs> <clears throat> So what you were saying, basically, I'm going to kind of tie this back in um, to faith and anarchy, libertarianism, is that, you know, different people in the liberty movement have different skill sets. And that Mm -hmm. is actually quite echoed in scripture, because we all have spiritual gifts. Yes. And so if everybody was a preacher, or everybody was a musician, or everybody was a writer, you know, although sometimes everybody thinks they're a writer because of social media. (laughs) (laughs) I've I've edited their stuff. They're not. Oh, oh, whenever I write something, I basically am like, give it to somebody and they don't really edit it. They are just like, well, that was a neat idea. Let me just write a new one. Let me rewrite this for you. (laughs) I will freely admit that's one of my strengths. Nothing longer than, you know, a few paragraphs. But so I think that there is natural truth in libertarianism, but it is Mm -hmm. not ultimate truth. So uh, I know that you kind of started your journey and it changed, it shaped your faith a little bit, changing your political beliefs. And that right. kind of did for me, but it's not because libertarianism or anarchism is my religion or my God. I just think that it's got a lot of truth in it and right. God is truth. So you can right. find that in a lot of places. Yeah. And, and, you know, truth is, truth transcends all of the, we, we, we have all of these different areas of thinking we have philosophy and we have science and we have biology i guess that's part of science and we have mathematics and we have history we have all of these different things threads of truth run through all of those things and and weave them together and those different aspects reveal different kind of different parts of the ultimate fabric of truth. So you, you learn things from biology or chemistry. You learn things from philosophy. You learn things from, um, from your religious background and faith. And all of those things weave together this tapestry of truth. It's kind of like the old analogy of the uh, elephant. You know, you're feeling the elephant through the fence. And uh, uh, if, you, if you reach through and you grab a tusk, you're going to have a vastly different understanding of the elephant than if you reach out and grab its tail. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still the same elephant. And so we need all of the perspectives. We need science. We need religion. We need politics. We need philosophy. um, We need mathematics. We need whatever things I'm leaving out to help us to understand the the totality of truth. We definitely need lots of, of, or or sports pups, which are really better than sports balls. My husband is an ultra runner, so I call his thing sports legs. (laughs) You want to do your sports legs, honey? Sports legs. Yes, exactly. (laughs) So yeah, and and your your example of the of the church, you know, it's perfect. It's uh, the the where Paul talks about in um, again one of the Corinthians about you know the hand isn't a foot. We need a hand and a foot. Um, the uh, the same thing is true in our our libertarian world. We need all of these different people doing all of these different things, and sometimes they may even seem contradictory. You know, if you have somebody that that is spiritually gifted. Um, in in prophecy, which is kind of like preaching, you know, telling the truth. And you have somebody else whose spiritual gift is mercy. They're going to have a very different approach to the homeless guy that walks into the church. Your your guy that's oriented towards prophecy is going to be trying to preach to him and say, you need to get your life straightened out and do this and do this. And the person who has mercy is going to be back in the kitchen, you know, fixing him a meal. You need both because they do need to get their life straightened out, but they also need a meal. Um, yeah. so, so we do need all of these different, different parts and pieces and, and, uh, maybe we do better to recognize the importance of our diversity instead of trying to shove everybody into, uh, whatever pathway that we think is best or that we're equipped for. Um, and then another part of that too, I think where faith and, and libertarianism kind of interwine, intertwine or whatever would be, um, leading by example. Mm-hmm. So the best way to get somebody to stop advocating for violence is to show them, A, I'm not a violent person and, right. you know, it's working pretty well for me yeah. uh, the same way with Christianity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I can, you know, it goes back to the analogy I use with my wife. If, if, I can, if I can show you my relationship with my wife and you can see who she is, um, you're going to get far more understanding than if I you know, stand back here and tell you about how awesome my wife is. My, my wife is very awesome, by the she way. She is. And she's really funny too, by the way. Yes, <laughs> I can vouch for that too. <laughs> yes, she, she definitely is. It's a, 
always a hoot at the Meharry household, but, but yeah, you're <laughs> definitely right about, about that. Um, it's, it's oh. something that we need to live. It's not just a philosophy. It's a lifestyle that we live. We want to live free. We want to live peacefully. We want to live in a way that promotes human flourishing. I love that term human flourishing. I can't remember yeah. where I first saw that, but that's really, that's what we're looking for, right? What is the best way to accomplish human flourishing? I would suggest that hitting each other is not the best way to yeah. accomplish human flourishing. I, I quite agree. <laughs> um, in fact, I think I ran, oh, like something shut up in my Facebook memories yesterday. And it was something, a quote, I quoted you on something, hitting people is not, something about adult interaction. I can't remember what you said. And I'm trying to get you to remember something from my Facebook <laughs> I, I memory. I have no idea. But I think I tagged you. So <laughs> anyways, it was a good quote. Hey, if you don't follow uh, Mike on Facebook or wherever, you know, go there. So where else can people find you? All right. So we've talked about Godarchy. You can go to godarchy.org uh, and just check out the website. You can actually, uh, you can sign up there. And, and anytime I do a post or release a podcast, uh, it'll pop up. And then if you go there, you'll also find all of the various places that the podcast is available, which is like your typical iTunes, Stitcher, Google, uh, YouTube, uh, Spotify, all that stuff, all that links, you'll find all of that at godarchy.org. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at M Meharry 10th. So it's like the number one zero T H. I'm not a very good Twitter, but I, you know, every once in a while, like I get on a roll. Um, my best Twitter game is actually retweeting all of the awesome quote, uh, tweets that Michael Bolden puts out. So. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's pretty good at the yeah. he's pretty good at the twitters. <laughs> yeah, he's very he's very pithy on the twitters. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm there. I am on Facebook. If you uh, friend request me, I'll, I'll most likely accept your friend request unless you look crazy. And I have a pretty big leeway. I, I tend to <laughs> tend to friend every way and then block them. Like the, like the people when you auto, you friend them and like within 45 seconds, they're instant messaging you. That yeah. you blocked really fast. Yeah, I know. I get those. <laughs> yeah. But it's um, funny when I first, I don't know if I friend requested or not. We had some mutual friends and you, we were in a group um, of libertarians and you had a hockey mask. But honestly, I didn't know that you liked hockey. And I thought, is this guy trying to be edgy? <laughs> like, I thought it was like a Jason man. <laughs> right, right. That's funny. Yeah, and I'm probably. Like, his name sounds familiar. And I think I was listening to Tom Woods. I'm like, oh, that's the guy. That makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. That was probably, I think I know exactly what that picture was. Too. I think it's probably the one with the stitches on it. Yeah, it's which is pretty like edgy. A, yeah, it's like a famous, uh, it was a famous goalie mask. Um <laughs> So yeah, I'm on the Facebook. Uh, you can check out my own personal website, which is michaelmeharry.com. If you're interested in constitution stuff, uh, that's more oriented towards that. You can find my books. Um, you mentioned constitutional owners and constitution owners manual. Uh, I also have another book called um, Our Last Hope, Rediscovering the Lost Path to Liberty, which is about nullification, uh, which is another yes. statisty thing, but uh, very oh, it's effective. Oh, excellent. In, Decentralized. Yes, decentralization yeah so that's it at, at my website i also have music over there if you're interested in uh in hearing my hacking at, at keyboards and saxophone uh that's that stuff's all on my website and then of course if you're interested in the economics and the uh the finance stuff shiftgold.com slash news um pretty much everything that's there i've written so awesome well you really do actually have a large scope of liberty you were talking about finding your niche you've got a bunch <laughs> yeah well you know, that's, that's the, uh, the, the beauty and curse of being trained in journalism. I'm really good at distilling and articulating other people's ideas. Um, so, you know, it makes I, you a good I, editor too. So yeah, I'm so, going to send you some stuff over. <laughs> so if you want to know what, if you want to know what Michael Bolden, Peter Schiff, you know, if you want to know what those people think, uh, and, and not have to wade through all of this stuff that they say, you can just come to me and I'll, 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 I'll give you the condensed version. <laughs> you hear, heard it here first folks. All right. Well, we did talk about Christianity and faith, and I contemplated whether I was going to close out the show the way I normally do. But honestly, I'm going to say it anyway. It's got to be done. <clears throat> it's got to so, be said. I wish you peace, grace, and love, and fuck the state. Amen. <laughs>